Welcome to another episode of Black Lions Airspace. I'm your host, Zachary Shilo. I have a very special guest, and she's very cute looking and very powerful in the podcasting world, uh, to me. She's an actress, a singer, songwriter, producer. She has two hit songs, I believe, Blaze of Glo- no, Road to Glory and Rise, which you please should listen to. And I believe that she should have a new single coming out at the end of this month, which we'll touch upon soon. With that said, welcome to Black Lion's Domain, uh, Lauren LaGrasso. Oh, thanks, Zach. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> okay, so I discovered your show roughly about January after moving back into my parents' house. And I thought, oh, wow, she's very, very creative, and I love what she's putting out there. So my first episode was with your dear friend Jim Quick, whose book, uh, Limitless, I believe, is out right now. I urge my listeners to listen. I mean, not to listen. Read it, please. Please go and read it. (laughs) Well, I believe we're roughly in the same age group. If uh, People Magazine actually got it correct. <laughs> well, <laughs> by I the can't way, do libel. But, which, by the way, congratulations are in order on getting in there. Thank you, Zach. I read the whole entire article, and I was shocked by your age, and I was said, wow, she's younger than me by a few years. Oh, man, but... Again, thank you very much for coming on the show. It does mean a lot to me. Well, thank you for supporting my podcast. You know, anyone who supports my podcast, I think of as a friend. So, you know, I appreciate you. (laughs) Thank you very much. And I've been hyping up your appearance for the past few days now. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm hoping one day that you'll have me on a creative. Mm. When the time is right. Okay, so speaking of which, my listeners may not know you completely. So would you like to give them a little bit of your uh, background? Sure. So it's always a long and winding road. But basically, I grew up in Metro Detroit. I went to school at Michigan State. I got a BFA in acting, a BA in communication. I needed three more credits to complete my degrees. And so I decided that I'd do an internship so that it could take me to one of the coasts. I was at the time thinking of either New York or L.A. I applied to a show uh, in L.A. called The Ellen Show, Ellen DeGeneres Show. Ooh. And then I applied to Sirius XM in New York. I ended up getting both of them, but I found out about The Ellen Show first and it actually paid. So I went out there, finished up my degree in Los Angeles. About two months in, I decided to stay and pursue acting and like the last week of the Ellen show, I got my first ever paid big like on-screen acting gigs. And I joined SAG after I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be famous. This is amazing. Everything's happening for me. I went home for Christmas, came back, it was crickets. Like I was working as a, a yoga studio, like front desk girl and uh, doing like random promotional work. And I was so sad because I was really hustling for acting, but it just wasn't happening. And that's when I started writing music. It was born out of the heartbreak of acting. And within a year of writing my first song, and by the way, I did have like musical theater background, so it wasn't like I'd never sang before. But within a year of writing my first song, I played House of Blues, Viper Room, and Hard Rock Cafe. And I think it was because I didn't have an attachment to it. It wasn't like... For me, I'd been acting since I was three, so I had all of these feelings and all of this identity tied up in it, whereas music was this new, fresh thing. At the same time, when I was driving to all those gigs, I started listening to Sirius XM, and there was a show called Cocktails with Patrick, and he was from the same area in Detroit I was from, so I would listen to it. I was super homesick at the time. I'd listen to it while I was driving down the freeway and pretend like I was home in Michigan, and that's really when I became obsessed with audio. So I started saying out loud, speaking of manifesting, I'm going to work at Sirius XM. I'm going to work at Sirius XM. Fast forward a little bit. I ended up hosting at a place called After Buzz TV. And I met Kevin Undergaro and Maria Menounos, who were the founders and CEO of After Buzz TV. 
And I, through them, met the woman who was in charge of that show that I loved, Cocktails with Patrick, and all these other shows that had inspired me to become a radio personality and producer. And she's the VP of content there. I met with her, sent her like a list of 70 ideas. She ended up creating a position for me on Maria's show. And that's really what started my career in broadcasting. And um, at the same time, while I've been pursuing this career in broadcasting, I've also been working on my original music. And as you mentioned, put out two songs and I have another one coming out on June 26th. So I'm a, a, what I describe as a multi-passionate creative. Oh, man. I remember hearing your voice for the very first time. I, and I can actually uh, remember it very, very well. I said... Damn, she's got a great voice. And I almost uh, melted into gush. I'm blushing right now. If anybody <laughs> can see it. I'm actually blushing because her voice is very, very powerful. Oh, to me. thank you. Like my speaking voice or my singing voice? Yeah, both. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Especially your singing voice. When I heard your singing, I said, Woo! Get the fan. Get the fan. <laughs> as a dear old friend used to say. And then the one that actually made me melt the most, I actually saw a clip of you saying, uh, what is it? Uh, fuck money, baby. I said, oh my oh. God. Woo. That okay. was a very, what you're, what you're referring to is a very silly song parody I did. Uh, you, when what you like. On, the, on Sam Roberts' show, uh, Sam Roberts, he, he now is on the Sam and Jim show, or the Jim and Sam show, but he had this character that would come on his show often called Virgil. He, you know, do you know Virgil from wrestling? You're WWE guy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, know. do you know Sam Roberts? Yes, I do. Yeah. I actually ran into him a few years ago, like 12 years ago. He was actually commentating for this uh, wrestling promotion called Jersey All Pro. Oh, cool. So, yeah, so that was something that I did for his show, and he featured it on there. And, you know, I left it up because I thought it was actually kind of a good tune. <laughs> oh, I thought it was, too. I said, oh, baby, okay. Okay. I hear what she's talking about. But I actually felt it more so in the heart. Like, yeah, that's not what all life is about. Thank you very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Seriously. Okay, speaking of your music, <clears throat> what attracted you to it, really? To music? Yes. Well, I always have loved music. You know, growing up in Metro Detroit, I was very influenced by Motown, and I love Billy Joel. was, like, one of my favorites in high school, and all these incredible singer-songwriters like Fiona Apple and Sarah Bareilles and Ingrid Michaelson. And so it was something I always loved and revered, but it was something I didn't, like I told you, know I could do until later in life. So what drew me to it was that I started playing guitar. And then when I was falling asleep at night, you know that stage when you're in between awake and asleep? When like yes. you'll, maybe you dream you're on a bike and like your leg kicks and you wake up. <laughs> so I was writing songs in that state with my subconscious mind. And I would wake up and I'd sing them into the phone. And finally, after this was happening for literally months, I was like, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to write songs. And after I committed to that and stopped saying, well, I'm not a songwriter, when I said I am a songwriter, they started flowing out of me. So I found my way to it really because I think it was always my destiny. You know, there's a, there's a crazy, crazy story. I'm not really much of a pot smoker, so this makes me sound like a pot <laughs> crazy smoker. But th this was like really, if you want to know the first like kind of, time I think I thought that I was a songwriter and maybe what opened up my mind to it I had never smoked pot until I was a senior in college right. and um, it was like literally my last week of Michigan State and I was supposed to sing at this award convocation show for my whole college the College of Arts and Letters at Michigan State and I had in my head that it was at 5 p.m. long story short it wasn't it was actually at 3 p.m. And so I missed it. Like they announced my name and I didn't come to the stage. And so I was after this and I wasn't high at the time, just just to be completely clear. I just had the, <laughs> the timing wrong. 
So I was hysterical after that happened because, you know, I was on the dean's list every semester. I was a high achiever. Like the fact that this was the last thing I would be remembered for was missing this important moment where I was supposed to sing was killing me. And I talked to my mom. I talked to a few of my best friends. Like I tried to talk to my teacher. Like no one could like pull me out of this. Finally, I talked to my friend Michael, who was a notorious pothead. And he was like, oh, why don't you come over? And when he picked me up, I, it smelled like pot in his car. And I was like, are you smoking? I'm going to try some. And I'd done it like one other time, but like this was the first time I did a lot of it. So I took five hits off of a water bong, which I guess is a lot. Um, I hit the floor. I freaked out. And I was like, if we don't go outside right now, I'm going to die. That's that was the quote. So I made him not talk to me. We held hands and walked all around campus, like we went and got ice cream. And I like gnawed the ice cream. I ate it because I like the thought of licking it was like I needed to eat the ice cream. And then the, the next thing that happened was I sang every single thought I had for two hours. And I kept saying, this is the real me. This is the real me. Now, at that time, I thought I was just being a weirdo high person. But what I found out since then, or what I really traced back, and this wasn't until I was doing music for years, I realized I was trying to tell myself that I was a singer-songwriter. And that this, this piece of yourself, this is the real piece of yourself. This is the piece that you've been hiding, that you've been pushing down. Because I had always made silly little fun songs, but I'd suppress that because I thought, well, I can't own that I'm a, a songwriter. I can't own that I'm a musician because I just sing. Um, so, yeah, I think that maybe that was the thing that really originally drew me to it. But then, you know, it was also that journey in L.A. and all the other things that made me finally pour the music out. Oh, that's great. As I touched on, you actually have two songs, uh, <clears throat> Road to Glory and Rise. How did the composition for them come about? So Road to Glory actually was primarily written in an airplane. One of the many side jobs that I had in L.A. was doing auto shows. I would travel all around the country talking about Scion cars, which for a long time was a part of Toyota. And so I was on the way to Cincinnati for the auto show. And I mm -hmm. distinctly remember the song kept coming to my head. And so I kept running so that I didn't scare the person next to me. I kept running to the bathroom and singing the song into my phone and running back. And I actually listened back to it recently. Most of the chorus still remains exactly as it was that first time I sang it in the plane on the way to Cincinnati from L.A. And then it was written after that. So I got the chorus down then. It was written over the course of like actually several years. Um, it was finally finished, I think, in 2015. And then in 2018 or 19, we went back to the drawing board on it and revamped a few things to make it the song it is today. But most of it, like the bulk of it, the most important part came in that plane. And actually the second most important part, the bridge, came while I was driving through the streets of Detroit. So I think that one's really interesting because it's such a forward moving song. And all of the parts of the song that were most impactful came while I was in motion. Um, Rise came actually as a result of another song that I had written that we scrapped, but we took the same concept and used it in this song. Um, we scrapped that one because it was called Witch Hunt. That was before like Donald Trump used that phrase all the time. And it just like <laughs> it lost its meaning because of that. Um, but it was about a system or it was about a relationship, like a abusive relationship I was in that I survived and like coming out of that and realizing that like you're stronger on the other side of it. But really, you can you can look at it as like an anthem for anybody who survived a system of abuse. Um and who's risen out of adversity. And that one came from, so like it was inspired by that other song, Witch Hunt, but me and this girl, Miranda Glory, wrote it together. And um, Carrie Cole, like she kind of like helped with the A&R piece of it and set me and her up. And then my, um, my producer helped us put together the rest. So that one was really a completely collaborative piece. And um, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Well, I first heard Rise, and then I went back to <clears throat> Glory. I said, oh, these are great songs. I love them both. I actually would say that Rise was more so my favorite out of the two because it was so more empowering than Glory was to me. I don't know how. I don't know why. I could feel it more 
coursing mm-hmm. through me, especially in the last, I say, year or two, given my state of health and everything, which I'll talk about more so when we hit the common point that we came together for, which is a very mutual thing. All right, so you actually did touch upon your acting career a little bit. So what was your very first gig, would you say? Oh, man. Well, the first thing I ever made money for acting was uh, the Michigan Shakespeare Festival back in 2009. I played Audrey in As You Like It, and I played a nymph in The Tempest. And that was the first acting gig I ever had. Actually, you know, I've had a lot of luck with first acting gigs and then it gets weird after that. Every first acting gig I've auditioned for, I've gotten. So like the first thing I auditioned for in LA, I got. And the first thing I auditioned for in the theater world, I got. Um, But I started theater when I was three. I did my first play or musical, The Sound of Music. What? You did it at the age of three? Yeah, I think I was I was between three or four. It, the The timeline's foggy, but yeah, it was oh, when I was wow. under five for sure. Now I'm trying to imagine a little Lauren Lagrasso actually trying to sing at on stage at three or four years old. Oh, I was very bold. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what would you say was your favorite acting moment? Definitely a play I did my senior year of college called References to Salvador Dali Make Me Hot. It's a mouthful. Um, I got to play this woman, Gabriella. I wish I could play it now because I am actually like, I think either the age or a little bit older than the age of the character. And at that time, I was only 22. So I don't think I fully got it. Um, But it was just such a multifaceted role. I mean, I was truly the lead in that one. It was my character that the whole play revolved around, which was so cool as a woman to get to stand in that kind of a passionate female lead, powerful role. And Oh, God. Technical difficulties have occurred. Oh. Hi. I hear you again. No, um, no. Where did I drop off? Okay. You were talking about uh, after the uh, 22 years of age part. Oh, right. Okay. I wonder what I said after that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, That's okay. Technical no, no, difficulties no, no. Do... happen with Skype and everything. Let's do yeah, yeah. our kids. Let's <laughs> do our kids. So, yeah, the, the reason why it meant so much to me, though, is because it was such a powerful female lead. It was such a passionate woman. She had every emotion. She was, like, a real person. And it was something that when I was younger or even when I first started college or a couple years into it, I never thought I could play a role like that. I thought I would only be pigeonholed into these super like quirky, comedic, funny, over-the-top roles. And so to realize that I had grown and stretched enough where Mm -hmm. I could really showcase this other side of myself, like the way I would always describe myself in acting as my like type is I'm uh, Deepak Chopra meets Amy Sedaris. Like I like to, (laughs) to run the gamut of like, weird, crazy, kooky out there, and super deep, spiritual, introspective, multi-layered. So, yeah, that's what I was in acting, and I kind of think that's what I am in life, too. Oh, wow. Well, you actually do have a great balance to you. I love your energy since day one. So if that means anything to you, I'm being very humble right now. Ah, thank you. It means a lot to me. So please keep that up on your own show. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I can't stop. Won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of Unleashed, how did that come together? So I wanted to do a show from the time I was young. I would, like, when I was little, make my mom videotape me doing fake talk shows in our living room. And 
I always have that in the back of my mind. I mean, honestly, that's why I got into producing was because I wanted to be on air as many of us do. And so when I started up at this new company, one of the things that I had set in mind was that not only was I going to produce all these shows, but I was also going to create my own. So it went through so many different names. I mean, it started out, I don't even remember, I think it was called Getting There, like about the path and what it takes to actually get there. Then it morphed into um, shaking things up with Warren LaGrasso, which was super inspecific and like not helpful. Then it morphed into something that was interesting, which was fear of failure with Lauren LaGrasso, where I was going to talk to guests about their fear of failure and how they overcame it or how they're working to overcome it. Then it morphed into how to be an artist, which is most closely aligned with what it is today. But I realized people are going to see that and think it just pertains to art. Then it finally morphed into Unleash Your Inner Creative like two months before I launched the show. And I just felt like that was much more comprehensive because my whole goal was just to show everybody that listens that they are creative, that unleashing, unlocking this part of themselves is going to help them live a more fulfilled, profitable, happy, spiritual, deep life. And yeah. Yeah. I felt like that was really like the name that kind of made everything happen. And I, at the first, when I first made it, I was working with this girl, Juliet, and mm-hmm. she really helped get it off the ground without her. I couldn't have done it. So it was definitely, it took a team and super grateful. It happened. It's been a great journey. Well, I'm happy that you did come up with that name because that was among the top three choices by anchor to listen to when I actually was, Luxing around on Anchor <laughs> one day. So thank you, Anchor. Thanks, Leo. Anchor. Love Anchor. <laughs> They're great. And that's been my home almost a year now, as mm-hmm. far as solo recordings. So if anybody from Anchor truly is listening to this, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And to my mentors who actually came along the way. Thank you for actually putting me on the path, like I've said time before, and for letting me use Anchor under your blessing. So that means a lot. Speaking of uh, mutual ground, you did touch upon the word manifestation. And usually, mm-hmm. folks, when there's the word manifestation, it attracts, and with that said, it's about the law of attraction. Like attracts like. My experience with it, I believe so, became around in November or early December, either which way. Uh, I just broke up with my now ex fiance and I was feeling a certain type of way. And I've already gone through this change called the uh, flow, the flow state. And I'll touch upon what that is again, ladies and gentlemen, if you are listening to me for the first time or have forgot what it is. The flow state is basically, I would say, ultimate focus. You know what you truly want and you can feel the power coursing through your veins. And it almost feels like a high, but it's not like a high that's chemically induced. It's more so a state of mind. It's a state of being than a comatose. So anybody can obtain it, like I said, time and again. And I believe uh, my wonderful guest here, she's obtained it in some form or shape. Just like my dear first fiance, uh, Melody, has. And anybody can truly obtain it. If you are passionate about what you want to be in life, like I am, like Lauren is, you can obtain it. So please, for one second, take out the notion that you cannot obtain this. You can obtain it is very obtainable, but you got to have almost a clear cut path to what you want and not let almost anything or anybody stop you in the process. 
with that said, the laws of attraction brought me to you. I found you, as I said, back in January. And then I was listening to, I believe, uh, Sonia Riccati. She was the one that actually gave a certain suggestion or she was telling her own life story about how she met Oprah. And I took that to heart and I said, hmm, okay, if she can do it, so can I. Let's try this with different people. <laughs> so I actually had you in mind and I kept on saying it. I'm going to get her. I'm going to get Lauren. I'm going to talk to Lauren LaGrasso. Somehow, some way, I'm going to make it happen. And then I actually did find your information. And uh, I believe your assistant's name is Nicole. Or your friend, one of them. Yeah. Nicole was yeah, my so publicist I, for a while. <laughs> oh, your publicist. Okay. So I reached out to her and CCU, I believe, uh, March 9th. You came around, I would say, maybe March 22nd. Then we started talking more and more. And as we started talking more, I started to believe even more. I said, oh, my God, she actually responded. This is awesome. <laughs> and then it got deeper and deeper and deeper. And here we are. And I never gave up. And my... Coming on because you are ultimately creative. You support creatives like myself and others. So, how did you come into the laws of attraction completely? Well, I think I'm still like, it's not just something you're like, I've arrived and now I understand everything. I think, like anything in life, you have to keep working on it and whittling away at it because. We are, as you probably know from the most one of the most recent episodes I did, like predispo predisposed. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Yeah, um, to about. like to to seek out negativity and to look for confirmation of what we already believe. And so, if you're somebody who's been deeply entrenched in negative thoughts, which most of us are, if we're not trying to practice good mental hygiene, then. <laughs> you're going to have to continually work at it. So like, just like anything, it's not like you like arrive to this moment where you have total enlightenment and then you can just ride a wave for the rest of your life. You have to keep working at it. But the first time I really heard of it was in high school and it was through Oprah actually was one of them. She had on <laughs> a bunch of people that were founders of the secret. They were people who were really getting out the word about the secret. And then the other one who, who was talking about this even before Oprah had it on was Wayne Dyer. And he's actually from Detroit originally too. He talked about the uh, the power of attraction. And I don't know if he used the word law, but I think he said power of attraction a lot. So he would always say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And my mom, she was a big Wayne Dyer fan. She brought him to me. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is so annoying. Like, what does that even mean? And then <laughs> As I got more toward the end of high school, beginning of college, I really started to understand it. Um, and I think that really, like, the first thing I used on, to be completely honest, was in high school, I was in love with my best friend, Johnny. And Manganello. Yes, right. Johnny Manganello. But I, I want him on eventually one day. Oh, good. I, you should reach out to him. Yeah, I'll actually uh, CC you in it, too, so that way he doesn't think this is a... Uh... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you know how I actually talk, we're going to actually rip it up a little bit. This is not bullshit. <laughs> so when this is all said and done, I'll try and reach him. Please continue. I'm sorry. All good. So anyway, I was, like, head over heels in love with him. And the first thing I really use Law of Attraction on was getting over him. So I would like picture this we weird big connection between us. Like, I, you know, you could picture it as a string, like a connection between someone else. I would mm -hmm. picture this like, but for us, because we had such a tight connection, it was massive. So I pictured the literal physical connection between us. This is very strange. And I pictured an ax going through it. Oh. And then I visualized a new loving light connection. And I would pray every day, 
for like a year, I prayed, like, I hope that someday, uh, like, God, please allow me to someday understand why this happened with me and Johnny and like why he couldn't ever love me back um, and allow us to both find love in our own right and allow us to be able to be pure friends. Well, I found out, you know, maybe he d- wouldn't have liked me if he was straight anyway. I think he would. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I found out it happened because he was gay. We've both found multiple different loves since then. And we are the best of friends because now that energy of like broken heartedness isn't between us. And there's like that. I feel like there's a part A and a part B of our relationship. So I really saw it first manifest there because I got every single thing I asked for. Other extreme times would be in college. I would go around saying, I'm going to work on the Ellen show. I'm going to be an intern on the Ellen show. I had no idea how it was going to happen. But then one day, a friend of mine, Brandon, came up to me and said, hey, I've got a friend who's a a PA there, production assistant. She has, like, no power, but she might be able to put your resume to the top of the pile. I reached out to her, but I found out they didn't take summer interns, so I kind of just forgot about it. And then when I realized I needed those three credits, I reached out again. This was, like, a year and a half later. Well, a week before I reached out to her, she had been upgraded to production coordinator, who is the person who's in charge of hiring interns. So it was just like literally perfect timing. And that's another example. But like the most powerful tools I found are being really, really, really specific with what you want. Are you still there? Because you're frozen for me right now. Christ. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> I'm just audio then. Okay. Um, oh, Jesus. So, so being really specific with what you want, like, it's, it's pretty undeniable what I want to be an intern on The Ellen Show means, right? Like, I think the times when I haven't manifested was when I was super all over the place. Like, saying I want to be a professional singer, it's nice, but it's actually not very specific. Like, saying I'd like to make six figures from doing live tours at, with me as a front person. That's super specific. So I think in the past, I've been, like, afraid to get too specific with, things like music because it's so deeply a part of me but that's what I'm working on now because I realize every single time I have been specific I've manifested it and I think that's the biggest thing is being specific finding what teachers of manifestation work for you I really recommend Wayne Dyer Gala Darling is amazing Um, Wayne Dyer does this manifestation meditation that's really great it's totally bizarre but every time I've ever done that it's worked I love um, Abraham Hicks It's actually odd. It's a woman, but she... Yeah, I know who Abraham is. Yeah, exactly. But for those that don't know, she channels this energy or these like energy she calls Abraham and her manifestation, especially the money manifestation meditation, it's super powerful. I got, while I was listening to that one, I would do it every morning and I got two unsolicited raises just listening to that. Yeah. So um, be specific, seek out teachers that make sense to you and keep working on it because your your negative thinking isn't going to go away just because you want it to. It's not. Oh, boy, I'm frozen again. Holy Jesus. <sighs> Let's try this mobily. Oh, hey. uh, going to have to switch to mobile mode, kids. So... We will actually have a brief break so Zachary Scheibel can transfer over to mobile mode. 